Good afternoon, Brighton. How is everyone today? I'm going to need a little bit more energy. How is everyone this afternoon? There we go. Have you been enjoying yourself? Yes. All right, brilliant. So my name is Whitney Isles. I run an organization called Project 507, and we work around violence. And we do a lot of different types of violence reduction in the community and also in the prison setting. And it's something that I've grown to really love and really want some more systemic change. And a couple months ago, when Toby gave me a call, well, he gave me a tweet first, and he said, hey, I've seen your first TEDx, really want you to come and do TEDx Brighton. And I was like, wow, didn't even know you could do two. So hey, wicked, brilliant, I'm there. And he said, well, what would you want to speak about? And I was like, well, prisons, prisons, yes, prisons and the greater good. And in my head, I had this really amazing idea of how I was going to impress you all with all this you know, brilliant theory. I was gonna go into the history of it and I was gonna look at the greater good and where the greater good came from and look at moral law and it was gonna be amazing. It really was. And then I remembered that I run a company that deals with violence and that I rarely get a moment to myself. So plan B was, I'm gonna go onto YouTube and I'm gonna look at all the different TED Talks around prison. <sighs> On page six of the search engine, I realized that wanting to watch all the other prison, uh, all the other TED Talks around prison was not the greatest idea. First of all, I probably wouldn't have got through it all in the, the time allocated. And second of all, it, I became very kind of insecure about what I was going to speak about. Because guess what? Every single thing that I wanted to talk about had already been spoken about. But then this interested me some more. Because then I was thinking, hang on a minute, it's 2016. We kind of know the prison system isn't really working the way that we need it to. We know this. We have all the information that tells us this. And not only that, we also have a lot of really amazing solutions from all over the world. I think it was the Netherlands I was looking at the other day that are actually closing down prisons because they don't have enough criminals. Wow, wicked, brilliant. So then I came across this quote. And it might be a little bit wrong because I am from the, the Instagram kind of generation where the quotes just go up and you don't really check them. You just say, oh, it sounds good, works for me, it's working for the presentation today. <laughs> <laughs> but it really hit a nerve with me because I do a lot of work in the prisons and I also do a lot of work in Parliament and with the MOJ and NOMS and there's some really fantastic people behind the scenes doing some work to see if we can really make some real systemic changes to make our whole lives better. And it says, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And it made so much sense to me. It, something just clicked. Because everything about prison is punishment and security. So a lot of the changes that are being made still have to go in line with punishment and security. And yes, security is a big deal. I'm not saying that we don't need it. I'm not saying there, there aren't people that do need to be kept away for a little bit. But then I thought, what if we changed our thinking around this? Because it can't just come from the prison system. It has to come from all of us. All of us needs to start thinking a little bit different, and I'll tell you why. About a month ago, I was sitting down with one of the heads of the parole board, and I was talking about sentencing. And I said, I've got so many amazing young men that have been completely re rehabilitated and that should be out in the community. They actually have jobs waiting for them, but they still have another year, year and a half, two years left of their sentence. And that's 40,000 pounds a year for them to sit and wait to get back out into the community. And he said, wait, this is a really great idea. And there's a lot of people having these really good ideas. The problem is the current political climate. The way that the public perceives offending and prisons and what needs to be done will not accept these changes quickly. And that hurt. Because this is my world. 
This is where I spend most of my days, with my team. And we work with those young men and young women, normally under the, the age of 25, in various different prisons across the UK. And every single one of these young people have a story. And we work with the more, what would be considered the more high risk, the more violent, the ones that are in prison being violent. But when we break down those stories, these are young people that are dealing with trauma. They're dealing with pain, they're dealing with flashbacks, they're dealing with nightmares. They're dealing with the fact that they watched their mother get beaten up when they were four. They're dealing with the fact that they've been sexually abused and never told a soul. They're dealing with the fact that they've got multiple, multiple family members dying of cancer. And they're not allowed to go to funerals because it's considered too high risk. And they're sitting in these cells, and sometimes they're sitting in cells for 23 and a half hours a day with no TV, no radio, and just all their thoughts in their head. And this hurts. And yeah, sometimes prison can be a bit like a youth center. Yeah, there's pool tables, there's playstations. And yeah, sometimes it can be really, really violent and people get killed and people kill themselves. And those are the two extremes that we're shown in the newspapers and the media. And I think we do need to be aware of that, but we also need to be aware of all the journeys that are happening in between. And all the things that these people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. The fact that phone credit is still so high in prison and you're looking at having to spend 15 pound a week just to have around 30, 40 minutes speaking to loved ones. When out on the roads, you can spend 20, 20 pound a month and get unlimited calls. So once these young people are in the system, they're pretty much stuck in the system to fend for themselves. And yes, there, are, there is so much progress being made, but there is still so much more to be done. So one of the things that I want everyone to start thinking about different. Imagine if we really thought about violence as a public health issue. Imagine if we took the punishment element away from prisons and we started thinking, what if we did physiotherapy for the mind? And we had individualized plans that were looking at healing. Because these people in prisons need healing. They don't need more punishment. The prison is punishment enough. But for these young people, and for everyone in general to get their healing, we need to be more concerned about them. Because once you sit there and you speak and you listen, and I spend all my days listening to stories, you understand that actually a lot of these people are the ones we let down. The ones that slip through the different surfaces. If you're in care, you're more likely to end up in prison. That doesn't make sense to me. So today I wanted to use this platform as a way to get the general public thinking a little bit more about prisons and about the people that are in prisons because they are people. And yes, there will always be the small minority that have some real complex, hard issues and they might need to be sent away for a, a very long time. But the majority of the people that I come in contact with on a day-to-day -day basis are people that are searching for healing. They're searching for a space to grow and to be better. And they are scared. They are terrified to come back out and face you and face the world and face the judgments. And there's a few things we've been working on recently which I just want to show and, and give some attention to. Because I feel like there's still really valid um, issues in 2016. In fact, I can't believe in 2016 we have these issues. The first one is the Young Review. And there's so many different reviews coming out now. There's the Charlie Taylor Review, there's the David Lammy Review, which is coming out next month. And they all highlight issues which we feel like we should have been dealing with already. We feel like they should not be an issue anymore. The fact that there's over 43% of young people, so under 18s, in the prison system right now are of black and ethnic minorities. That is a huge disproportionality compared to how many there are young people in the communities right now of BME backgrounds. There's still so much more that we need to, need to be doing in regards of race and putting race back on the agenda in, in our criminal justice system. 
joint enterprise. You might have seen joint enterprise on the news. It's a, it's a big topic, and there was changes earlier on in this year. And if anyone gets a chance, I'd highly recommend that you go and have a look at the charity Jengba, because they are some amazing mums that are really putting their life and, well, they're really putting their life on hold to save their children. Now, joint enterprise means that if we're all out together, and we're in a club or we're out with our friends, and I do something wrong, if you didn't stop me, you can go down for the same crime I did. We have 15-year-olds that at the time of an offense were legally blind, doing a life sentence for murder, because one of their friends decided to hit another man, and murder is wrong on all cases. I, I'm not saying that we need to be any more leading on that. But if there's children that are present or not even around, and they can still get 20, 25, 30 year sentences, I don't understand why we're not doing more about that. I have young men that I'm working with doing 34 years. That means they have to do their 34 years before they can come home for murders that they didn't even commit. And once you start understanding trauma and behavioral change, you understand that actually it's easy for someone to, who's um, suffering from post-traumatic stress to stand there and watch when something's happening because they're in fight or flight. And there's a lot of these injustices still happening within our system. IPP, imprisonment for public protection. This was abolished in 2012. You cannot be sent to prison on an IPP anymore. Yet we still have 4,000 prisoners in our system that can't come home. And they started prison, uh, prison sentence doing one year, two years, and now are doing 10 years, 15 years. And for me, one of the worst things that we could do to a person is to take away all their hope. And it's very, very small things that are preventing these things from moving forward. The IPPs, and I'll probably get myself in trouble next week when I go to head office, but the IPPs and the joint enterprises, they are down to public perceptions. We're only going to get changes in the system when the public actually stand up and go, oh, this is a bit wrong, this doesn't feel right. And it's not necessarily we're saying, let everyone out. But let's think about things slightly differently, because why are 4,000 people still in prison on, over, I think a lot of them are five times over their tariff? And most times it's because they haven't done a program. I saw one guy that was supposed to do a program around healthy relationships. He couldn't do it. He was refused to do it because he was gay. And the program was for heterosexual relationships. So he got his parole pushed back due to the fact that he could not do a program which doesn't even exist for him. And it's deep. And if we want real change in the system, if we want real change for these people and if we want a safer society for ourselves, we have to start thinking about prison and thinking about offending from a place of love rather than a place of hate. Because whenever I write an article for The Guardian or for The Huffington or for whatever else I do, and whenever I see things like this in the newspaper, I see these kind of comments. And these kind of comments hurt my heart more than anything else in the world because they're not helping us. And I'm not saying that we need to be completely lenient and we need to forget about the victims of crime. Because there's nothing I want to do, there's nothing more that I don't want to do in regards of working with children that have killed children. My heart can't take that no more. I understand that, I feel that. And I don't want that to happen anymore. I want us to end this circle of pain and we're only going to do that when we start looking at our systems from a loving, compassionate perspective. And we all start saying, this doesn't feel right. We need some change. We all need to stand up and start fighting for a better society that is more loving and more compassionate. Because when it's our most vulnerable children and young people that the system has failed, sitting in our prison systems, being ignored by the majority of the world. Something is wrong. So if you leave here with one feeling today, feel empowered, 
because you can do something. We can all get involved. We can all be more curious to what is going on. And we can all be a part of the movement for change. Thank you.